Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, this is a presentation by Rossini. My name is Brent Collier, uh, VP of Engineering for Lee Springs and R&D Director for Light Weighting. This, in this presentation, we're gonna uh, show you a novel approach, a high technology approach to multi-material Lee Spring design and manufacturing. And as one example, we're gonna show um, the project that we did for the Ford new F-150. A little bit of background on Rossini. Uh, Rossini is a tier one and tier two supplier to automotive industry. Uh, we employ over 6,600 uh, employees worldwide. We have eight plants and we have four key operating divisions. Um, one group is uh, the Lee Spring Group represented by over 50% of our revenues. Uh, the Briggs Group is also a large division for us, 34% of our segmentation. Coil Springs and our Elastomer Group. We also have a joint venture in Brazil uh, with NHK, and we supply the South American market with Lee Springs and Coil Springs. Uh, before we get into the presentation specifically, I'm going to talk a little bit about Hotchkiss uh, suspension, since that's where the Lee Springs are primarily used. Um, Lee Springs and Hotchkiss suspensions in general are low cost, very simple, and scalable. If you look at their applications in the market today, you can go anywhere from golf cart suspension applications to recreational trailers, all the way up to vocational trucks and mining and military application vehicles, okay? Uh, in North America in particular, the rear suspension on pickup trucks is a preference for this type of a, a suspension. Uh, and one of the reasons why it's, it's so prevalently used is that the Lee Spring is, it's a very robust for payload, towing applications, and does a reasonable job in the unladen conditions as well. The springs are typically designed as multi-stage spring rate curves, so we can handle unladen vehicle conditions and loaded conditions as well. And one of the things that's interesting about the Lee Springs is they're tunable for handling and steering. In other words, we can adjust the rear steer characteristics of the vehicle using the spring geometries. And I think finally, the other really important thing about the Lee Spring on a Hotchkiss suspension is that it's a very efficient spring member, okay? A lot of, you know, coil springs, air springs, things like that, those suspension springs are only working in one direction, the vertical load ride direction. Whereas the Lee Spring, it handles all six degrees of freedom in Cartesian coordinates, longitudinal forces, roll moments, lateral forces, pitch moments, and then the vertical uh, loads as well, and the yaw moments. So let's talk a little bit about spring, you know, terminology, just to make sure I, I got everybody with me. Um, in a, in a two-stage spring, as represented by this load deflection curve on the left-hand side, we start in a free unloaded condition, okay? We move into the curb position, which is where the vehicle would typically run in an unladen condition, okay? There's a transition point on the rate curve where the helper plate engages, and that happens between the curb and the design load, okay? And then we get into the second stage or the laden type rate, uh, taking up to the gower or the gross uh, axle rating, okay? We would call this configuration shown on the right-hand side a two plus one spring. And what that means is, is that the first stage rate is represented by two plates, okay, in the main plate, in the main pack. And then the plus one is referring to the helper. If there was two helper springs, this would be a, you know, a two plus two as an example, just to give you a little background in terminology. Now let's talk about light weighting opportunities. I think one of the things that's really important about Lee Springs is that we have extended the abilities of these springs through technology and light weighting is one part of it. So for example, if you were to look at springs back in the 1980s, you'd see these, you know, large pack, many, many plates stacked together and over time, we've been very successful in light weighting the springs through steel developments and alloy developments and the processing and manufacturing that goes with those alloys and different materials. From the 1980s up until the seals that we use today, we've gone from stress ranges of operating, and this is the jount stresses of the Lee Spring, from under 1,000 MPA to springs over 1,300 MPA in the market today. And remember, these springs are cycling, you know, in our test requirements, over 100,000 cycles over and over again, up to these stresses of 1,300. What the higher steel alloy and processing capabilities allow us to do is to go from these, you know, 1980 multi-pack springs to different lighter weight configurations today. The other light weighting opportunities that we have is if you take a look at the top left here, 
This is a typical multi-leaf beam approach. This is kind of going back to you know engineer, engineering 101s. Um, this is a simple beam, supported beam with a load in the middle of it. And then the stepping of constant thickness plates is used in a multi-leaf type spring application. It does a reasonable job to distribute the stresses evenly, okay? But there's further opportunity available. The ideal beam design is actually as a parabolic profile, okay? Where the, as you go as a position of length relative to the force position of the reaction points, the thickness varies as a function of a parabolic function. All right, and the advantage is, is, is simply this, as represented on these graphics on the right. A multi-leaf design, even though we step it to try to do the best stress distribution possible, there are these areas in the corners where we're not fully taking avail advantage of the high strength steel properties. Whereas in a parabolic spring, the stresses across the length, across the length of the beam, are evenly distributed so that we fully take advantage of those high strength steel properties we mentioned earlier. And then further, and probably what's most interesting about this presentation today, is what about changing the material uh, from steel to something else, okay? In this particular example, we take a steel helper plate and we convert it into a glass fiber reinforced plastic plate and we're able to reduce the weight by 53%, okay? The majority of the weight savings comes from the fact that the, the mass density of the, of the GFRP helper is much less. But the other interesting feature about the GFRP is, is that the modulus of elasticity is a very slow sloping rate, okay? It allows us as a spring designer, if you just think about just from the vertical rate perspective, far more flexibility in the design of the spring versus the steel, which has a stiffer strength property. Now let's get into the meat of it. Um, in the new model year 2021 Ford F-150, you will find all these technologies I've been talking about combined together. And this is what we call our one plus C technology. This new multi-material approach, we call it a hybrid spring, um, is taking the steel helper to GFRP technology and we're using HP RTM uh, for, this is a very high volume application uh, in our manufacturing. We converted the two plate multi-leaf design into a single plate parabolic monoleaf design for the main pack. We also did some improvements to improve clamp rigidity with a new top saddle um, rounded for the U-bolts. And then this was production launched in our facility in the fourth quarter of 2020. Now just a comparison of the springs on the left hand side was the previous platform, two plus one configuration. And then the new one is on the right hand side, the one plus C configuration. You'll notice that there's some features like clips and reduced number of plates that are different in the new design, okay? Also the top plaid used to be a stamping with square U-bolts, whereas the new design has rounded U-bolts with a distributed saddle top casting. Just a quick look at the FEA design approach. Um, this uh, main plate is made from the high strength steel alloys that we mentioned earlier, parabolic design. And we also design it by purpose to have the higher stress on the rear side of the leaf spring. And in the composite helper plate, you can see the stresses are quite a bit less evenly distributed as well. It also has taper thickness variation to maximize the stress distribution in the material properties. All right, what does all this mean? What does all this light weighting really mean? We're going to do an example here. And, you know, I can't give you the exact example on the Ford, but this is just a general example. Let's assume that 100 kg vehicle weight reduction improves a Petro internal combustion engine or an ICE engine vehicle emissions by approximately 8 grams of CO2 per kilometer traveled. And that basically equates to improving the fuel economy by about 0.34 liters per 100 kilometers traveled. Now let's get back to some chemistry math. What does this really mean? When you have a carbon fuel, when you burn it, it combines with the atmospheric oxygen. So therefore the carbon content that's in the fuel produces 3.7 times more CO2 by mass, okay? So if you take a typical US gallon of, of petrol, that contains approximately 2.4 kgs of carbon. So when we combust it, it's gonna produce 8.9 kgs of CO2. 
Let's take a hypothetical example. Let's say, for example, with the technologies we talked about earlier, reduces the spring mass by 7.9 kgs. That would equate to 15.8 kg mass reduction per vehicle as an opportunity. If the fuel consumption of that said vehicle is approximately 20 miles per gallon, that equates to 2.76 grams CO2 per kilometer traveled. Going back to our assumption, 15.8 kgs would say 1.26 grams of CO2 per kilometer traveled, which is approximately 0.5% fuel economy improvement. Now let's say that that said vehicle travels in its lifetime an average of 240,000 kilometers or about 150,000 miles. The lifetime savings opportunity for that said vehicle would be 302 kgs of CO2 and 129 liters of fuel saved over the lifetime of the vehicle. Now, let's say that mm, that program that's using the hybrid springs produces 2.5 million vehicles during the program lifetime. If you equate that into what the potential fleet lifetime savings of CO2 would be 758,000 tons, metric tons of CO2 and 322 million liters of fuel, okay? And again, this is all hypothetical. Now let's talk a little bit about the Rossini roadmap to composite spring developments. Our history with composite technologies goes back over 10 years. It started with some very smart uh, R&D structure, getting the right people on the team, structuring ourselves and committing to the technology. We also shared and collaborated with partners, including our customers to share ideas of how this could be accomplished in our products. We did alliances with universities and we worked very closely with the material, equipment and process R&D centers around the world. And then when we started to see opportunities actually come into fruition, we made investments in our composite prototype lab. And we eventually, once we got on the program, invested into the mass production equipment and material definitions. This was over 10 years that we've been working on this. Specifically with the hybrid spring for the F-150, we started back in 2017. We used the pre-preg technologies because the speed to make the samples and the tooling costs is, is much less than HPRTM. As we progressed into you know, the proof of concept development, we invested in a HPRTM smaller scale press, but basically the same technologies that would be used in the full production line. In this press, we were able to achieve a two cavity mold HPRTM prototype tool and further take the proof of concept to actually making something that'd be a pretty close representative of what would be production representative. Then we invested into the larger 10 cavity mold for HPRTM. We validated that and into the 2020, we launched our production lines. Next, I'm gonna show you a video of that production line. This is in, in today, let me just flip out of here. There we go, enjoy. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, just a, a quick look at what our investment in our composite prototype lab in, in, involved. Uh, we have a 400 ton HPRTM press 
and then all the equipment necessary to produce our prototypes in-house. As you can see in the video, we are now in production with our fully automated HPRTM manufacturing, and we are now the largest North America supplier of HPN, HPRTM parts. The composite plant that we invested in is approximately uh, 4,800 4, square meters. We have three fully automated HPRTM lines. The preforming is automated stacking, and we can actually stack it in different different uh, ply lengths and orientations, as well as layers. Um, the presses that we're using are 1,700 ton HPRTM presses, um, and they're fully automated interface with the handling robots and production press. The machining center you saw at the end of the video is fully enclosed, and we do the trimming and machining uh, in that space. And I think it's also important to, to mention is that the quality inspections, process parameters are all fully integrated, and traceable per part. You can see that we're putting the, the QR codes on each of the, uh, the helpers in the video. Uh, I want to recognize and acknowledge the team at Rossini and at Ford. This is a picture of the group, one of many Ford um, audits through our progression to having the, the production line fully in, in place today. Uh, and, and it was, you know, for sure, teamwork, partnership, and collaboration that made it successful. And then finally, I also want to, and I should say we, Rossini, also want to uh, show recognition and appreciation that, you know, we really couldn't have done it without all our supply partners. This includes the, the tooling suppliers, the material suppliers, the equipment suppliers, the, the automated uh, integration. Um, quite frankly, if it, it, if it weren't for, you know, the successful relationships, collaborations, um, this would have been a very challenging product. But, you know, I, can, I think it's quite, quite clear that it's a successful project and we're in production today and I want to thank you everybody for that. And with that, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for your time today.
So hello everyone. It, it appears that Brent left the meeting. Um, so I'll be happy to answer some of your questions. Um, so I see one question right here from <clears throat> one of you guys that says, which racing metric systems are we using? Yeah, as you mentioned also in the, as we showed you in the, in the presentation, we're using Hexion's epoxy systems. About the production capacity, we're speaking of between 25 to 30,000 cycles per year. So regarding the size of your mold, you can reach up to 1 million parts per year. Uh, about CRTM, I mean, we did um, we, we did consider many other processes. Um, we also evaluated the different um, costs and uh, investments that it will take for us to um, to do the different processes. Uh, either way, well, if it was compression molding, we also considered a uh, Varden um, vacuum RTM, um, but HP RTM was the one that uh, that gave us the best results and um, investment. Have you considered polyurethanes as an alternative? Uh, we have. We have also tested different uh, polyurethanes, and uh, it, it's not that we we don't like them or anything, but um, we had um, much more uh, efficient uh, results with the epoxy than we did with the polyurethanes resin that we tested. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that are there are many more resins and matrices that uh, that can can also be uh, be part of this um, be part of this type of pro product. Is there an interest on new products in development to increase the composite stress load and from main principle? Yeah, I mean, we have an R&D department and we're also um, working on different, uh, not only different um, materials, but also different shapes and other type of geometries that we use. And of course, we want to expand our stress load capacity for our composites by using different reinforcements, uh, additions, additives, and different matrices as well. Uh, using carbon glass and or glass fibers. So, so far for this project that you saw guys, uh, this is glass fiber that we use, reinforced with an epoxy matrix. Uh, but we also have different projects where we involve carbon with carbon fiber as well. Um, these are not production yet. We mostly do in, in the prototype, uh, prototype phase. Which results were much more efficient with epoxy compared to the tested PU. Uh, speaking of, um, we had compression, compression, um, compression results. Uh, when we speak of um, sampling, when we did the characterization phases and so on, I mean, we compared either flexural tension, compression, shear, uh, impact testing, and with some resins, we did we did have much more, uh, not not much more, but but more efficient results for the epoxy. Uh, and speaking also, it was also a matter of uh, of cost effectiveness uh, of the of the end up product.
about our lead time for prototypes. So depending on the process that you would like to, to see, but um, uh, let's say the fastest that we can get you a prototype, a working prototype, it's between six to eight weeks. Regarding that you already gave us a, a finished up uh, design on what you want. How do you see the market grow for lift spring parts in automotive industry? Um, Brian, could you help me out with, with this one? Maybe you have a better insight than, than myself. Sure. I, I think, you know, it really, I think the opportunity in lease springs is um, when you compare it to other suspension types, particularly for the truck markets, um, the Hotchkiss suspension is actually a very lightweight uh, suspension. Um, the, the interesting thing that's coming out is the, the BEV, uh, vehicles um, uh, with range anxiety. I think a lot of the initially launched uh, vehicles um, went to an independent rear in order to maximize the battery space. But as the batteries and the motors are becoming more efficient, I think what you're going to see on the future generations of the trucks as the EVs evolve uh, into higher volumes is the, the Hotchkiss will be reintroduced onto those suspension systems on the rear. Uh, and you'll, you'll see the, the lease springs and possibly even some of these hybrid technologies um, gaining a lot of traction in that space because of the, the light weighting um, and then also the efficiency that can be done from that type of suspension. What do you think about GFRP leaf springs recycling? So it will also depend a lot on the matrix that you use for recycling. I mean, if we speak about uh, glass fiber, of course, you can recycle and you can reuse it for another purposes. Um, so we do think it is achievable. 
Uh, the main problem right now it depends on the matrix that you use. If you use a thermoplastic matrix, then you will be able to chop everything up. But if you use a thermal set, then you will have to uh, maybe burn off the whole matrix. And I mean, the recycling that you do is going to be the fabric, but you're going to end up producing some more CO2 as well for the for the burning of the matrix. But it it, it is possible. It, it will be very interesting to see the the impact of the of, of the actual recycling versus the the burn off of the matrix. Thanks for asking. Kind of binder are you using in the fabric? Um, we use reactive binders as well. Um, I mean, it, we have we have used both, but for example, for for some cases, it depends on what what do you what do you want from your product, and also it has a lot to do with the metric that you that you use. Um, you have the let's say the non-reactive sometimes are mostly are thermoplastics, and in the end, you wanna you don't wanna make sure that the 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 contribution or the the mixture from the matrix and the binder, it's uh, very compatible. So it, I think if, for this question, it depends on, on what matrix you're planning to use. I mean, a reactive one, it's made of more thermal sets. So maybe you can use a polyurethane binder with a polyurethane matrix, and this, this could give you a much, much more uh, better results because of the compatibility that we will have with the, with the finished product. What have been the maximum fiber content you could reach? Um, this is a good question. I mean, it's not always about how much do you want to reach. It's mostly about what do you want to accomplish. For example, um, it, it's not just about let, let's use the most kind of amount of fiber so we can we can reduce the amount of residue you, yeah, that you want. I mean, you can. I mean, in the end, you have a finite space. You cannot just um, because of the high surface area that you have in your fabric or in your fiber, uh, you cannot just do um, a huge amount of fiber, right? But it has to be in the it's it's a balance between the properties that you want to achieve. Of course, if you have more fiber, you're going to achieve um, greater properties. But then you end up with problems with fiber with um I don't know with uh with dry spots and all that kind of things, uh, all those defects that you you don't want in a composite. So I would say it's not about the maximum fiber that you that you want that you can achieve. Mostly about what you need, which uh, rule of thumb would be, let's say, fifty fifty percent of uh, on volume content.
which typical property retentions percentage after aging do you use aim for resting qualification? Huh. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, typical property re retentions percent. Oh, you mean after maybe fatiguing and so on. Um, so uh, if, if this is what you mean by aging about maybe um, the property is going, uh, I mean, going down over time, I would say that um, at, at least you, you need the 90% of, of the other properties, not just from the resin, from the whole product in the end. I mean, you want that that the design of the product uh, can withstand the, the, let's say the whole lifetime of the of the product life uh, without failing because of the of the properties of the material you want to have a good design that can withstand the the stresses and, and loads that you for example in this case for the lift springs for the all the loads and stresses that you, it's going to be withstanding through the whole life of the product so i would say at, at least you need to achieve 90 percent of it this is also um, how you ensure to the, the client or the final customer that you have a good uh, a good product. Right, this this is not a question, this is more of a comment, but the, yeah, that is true. Key issue is the dry spots in RTM that limits the fiber content and then leaves performance for sure. I mean, you if you try to just use too much fiber, then you're gonna, you, you won't have any any room for the matrix that covers those, those dry spots or the whole fabric. So for sure, I'm, 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 as I mentioned before, it needs to be balanced between between the fiber amount and the resin amount. You want to be able to cover the whole thing, so you end up with a completely, uh, let's say, a pure matrix uh, reinforcement composite. But yeah, thanks for the comment. That is that is um, that is very correct. Are you planning your resin, PU, epoxy qualifications, campaigns? Uh, for sure. I mean, we're always, uh, as I mentioned before, we have an R&D department, which uh, we're always um, trying to improve our process and our products. Uh, we try to expand our, our folder of uh, different uh, matrices that we that we use. So for sure, I mean, if you guys um, have a proposal or anything that we would like to, to, qual to qualify, um, for example, another type of resin or matrix, we are very happy to look into a project with you guys or anything. Uh, just uh, give us a call and, and for sure we can subset, set something up. I believe this was the last question. I don't see anybody else writing something down. Um, I think we can close up our, our Q and A. Unless uh, Brent, Gary, you got any more comments or anything?
That was great. Thank you very much uh, for your help, Reyes, in answering the questions, and thanks for all the great questions from the uh, the audience. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.